Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and a warm welcome to the Commonwealth of Learning's webinar entitled Artificial Intelligence and Open Education, a Critical Studies Approach. Artificial intelligence is frequently hailed as a solution to many educational problems, and it has increasingly dominated discussions at social gatherings, in the classroom, in boardrooms, among education providers and legislators. It is therefore no surprise that we have a record number of 1,220 guests registered for this webinar. The guests will be following the discussion on both Zoom and the live stream on YouTube. To save time and have as many questions as possible, we are requesting guests on Zoom to put your questions in the question and answer section. Kindly mute yourself, sit back and enjoy this webinar. I would now like to extend a warm welcome to our guest speaker, Professor Wayne Holmes, who brings a critical studies perspective to the connections between AI and education and their ethical, human and social justice implications. Please allow me now to welcome Paul's esteemed president and CEO, Professor Asha Kanwar, for her introductory remarks and to introduce Professor Holmes to you. Over to you, Professor Kanwar. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. It is really an honor and a pleasure to <clears throat> welcome uh, Dr. Wayne Holmes uh, from the Knowledge Lab University College of London. Thank you for contributing your time and making it possible for this webinar to happen. Uh, Dr. Holmes has written several publications on AI and education, and he's been working in the field for several years, much before this whole uh, explosive interest in chat GPT came. Uh, so he has a kind of much more stable perspective on the field. Um, and uh, what is of particular interest to us is that he looks at the subject from the lens of human rights, ethics, and pedagogy, which are all of great interest to the Commonwealth of Learning. Um, as you all know, the Commonwealth of Learning promotes learning for sustainable development using distance learning and technologies. So this is very relevant and timely for us. And of the 56 Commonwealth member states, 48 are middle and lower income countries, which means they do not have the same access to connectivity, electricity, devices that uh, people in more resource rich contexts have. So how do they deal with this new phenomenon of <clears throat> generated AI chat GPT, because chat GPT has generated a new race. And there are several new chats coming up. How do we keep up with this? And I hope there will be some light on this from the talk today. Uh, the second issue is people are again talking about, you know, that this digital divide has never quite gone away. And is it going to be worse after these advanced technologies are uh, become more mainstream? Or is it an opportunity for us to actually, for developing countries to leapfrog right into where the action is and go straight to artificial intelligence rather than going through the various steps that other people have done? And then of course, uh, since the pandemic, there have been questions about you know, rethinking education, transforming education, this is a great opportunity also now with this development to rethink education and to ask ourselves, what is the purpose of education? Is it just human capital development or are there other dimensions that we need to think about? Because when we talk about uh, the sustainable development goals, we are talking about you know, preparing people for global citizenship, uh, people uh, preparing people for environmental conservation, et cetera. Uh, how do we use the technology to deal with all those things? Or what about quality control? What about reliability? Uh, is the technology going to run away with itself and leave everybody uh, quite confused and not knowing what to do? What are the opportunities? What are the risks? 
And I think most of our stakeholders would like to know that in very simple terms, you know, that what are the opportunities for education, uh, even in resource poor contexts, and what are the risks that they should be aware of. So with that, uh, let me invite Dr. Wayne Holmes to make his presentation. Wayne. Um, well, thank you very, very much for that kind um, um, introduction. To begin with, I'd like to start by thanking you and thanking the Commonwealth of Learning for the very kind invitation for me to join you today. Um, as mentioned in my talk, I'm going to offer a critical studies perspective on artificial intelligence and education. Um, so AI has been around for a while now and it's been involved in lots of different things. We've seen it beating the world's best player of Go, automatically identifying diabetes from retinal scans and helping protect against fraud, just to name a small number of things. And of course, now we have um, the famous ChatGPT and others such as Bard and Stable Diffusion and other large language models. Um, to name just a few successes. But impressive as it is, AI is not as sophisticated as many argue. And there are many myths. Now, the first myth is that AI is better than humans at image recognition. So when you look at this image, I'm sure you can recognize it as a panda. In fact, the AI agrees with 57.7% confidence. But what happens when we mix that picture of the panda with some visual noise? Well, we get this. And I'm sure that you will still recognize it as a panda. Now the AI is 99.3% confident. But unfortunately, it's confident that it's a given. Another myth is that AI doesn't need people. But again, that's not true. A human sets the objectives. A human chooses and labels the data. In companies like this, in developing countries like Kenya, where the workers spend all day identifying the objects in streams of video. Here's a person, here's a car, here's another person. These labelers are known as the ghost workers of AI. But also a human designs the network and writes the algorithms and then trains the network. A human then curates the outputs and makes the value judgments. So in short, AI does need people. We were also told that AI was going to bring huge benefits to tackle the COVID pandemic. But the reality is that AI contributed very little. None of the thousands of AI models were of any clinical use. And this is just one meta-analysis. I know of others that say a similar thing. So AI is impressive, but it's not as impressive as many people claim. So what about AI and education? In fact, AI does bring some interesting possibilities to education. But instead of being yet another cheerleader for AI and education, my focus is on the very many current challenges. Now, you might think I'm sometimes a bit negative, but I like to think I'm bringing a critical but constructive perspective. In fact, the connection between AI and education are more complex than many recognize. And there is still a lot of hype and exaggeration. But that's why we shouldn't talk about AI and education as if it were one thing. It's not one thing, it's multifaceted. And each connection needs to be considered separately. Now, I like to navigate that complexity in terms of two buckets. The application of AI and education, and the teaching of AI in education. Two distinct but complementary aspects of AI and education. Now in this talk, I'm gonna focus on the application of AI and education 
which is sometimes known as AIED. There are three types, student-focused AIED, teacher-focused AIED, and institution-focused AIED. So I'm going to take a whirlwind tour through them, starting with institution-focused. So this is the type of AI that's used in many businesses. It's AI for the boring back-end education administration tasks. It involves AI for recruitment and financial planning and some more education-focused tasks such as admissions, timetabling, learning management, attendance recording, and e-proctoring. Now, although important and growing, this has probably received the least focus by researchers or the commercial sector. So what about student-focused AI, ED? Now, this is where all the money is and where the focus has been for more than 40 years. Yes, I said four zero, 40 years, which is why there are so many different types as listed here. I'm only gonna summarize just a few. To begin with, there's the so-called intelligent tutoring systems or adaptive tutoring systems. The list on the right are just some of the multi-million dollar funded companies that are already offering this kind of tool. In summary, the system provides the student with some information and an activity or a quiz. And how the student responds determines the next piece of information, activity or quiz. This adaptivity means that in theory, every student follows their own pathway through the material to be learned. There's also what I call learning network orchestrators, which uses AI to connect people together, like Smart Learning Partner from Beijing Normal University. Now, what I particularly like about this tool is that it's the student who is in charge not the AI. Then there's chatbots, which are increasingly being used in education to provide immediate support to students. Mostly about practical things such as, where's my next class? Now, there are many other student-focused applications of AI, and I could go on for a while, but what about teacher-focused? Now, on the screen, we have the possibilities and until very recently, there's been relatively little AI that's generally designed to support teachers. Although I've not been able to find out much about them so far. But anyway, first, there's using AI to curate educational resources, such as Teacher Advisor and Clever Owl. Although all of them still need a lot of work to be really useful. The one at the top on the right there, X5 Gone is used to create open education resources. Then there's this tool, the AI Coach from Edthena, which is basically an adaptive learning tool for teachers. And then there are tools designed to support human teachers as they mark assessments. In other words, instead of the AI tools that claim to be able to do assessment for us, it's the teacher who does the assessing here not the AI. So that's applications of AI in education. But what about the claims, especially from the commercial sector? First, many claim that the AI education tools are intelligent, but they are not. No AI education tool is anywhere near as intelligent as a human teacher. Sometimes they might appear intelligent, but that's a long way from actually being intelligent. Another claim is that these AI ed tools will save teacher time. But that claim has been made about education technologies for almost a hundred years and it's never happened. I know that most teachers, including me, would love a tool that takes care of our marking, but no AI system is capable of the depth of interpretation or accuracy of analysis 
that a teacher can give. And what about personalization? This is something we hear about all the time. It's an ambition that's again been around for almost 100 years, which has re-emerged most recently from Silicon Valley. If we can have personalized recommendations on video platforms, such as Netflix, why can't we do that in education? But this completely misses the point. Some AI tools might provide each student with their own individual pathway through the materials, but they still take them to the same fixed learning outcomes as everyone else. For me, this is a weak understanding of personalization. It's more like the homogenization of students, ensuring that they all fit in the right box. For me, real personalization is not about personalized pathways, but about helping each individual student to achieve their own potential, to self-actualize, to enhance their agency, which is something that no existing AI tool does. Education is also all about collaboration and the other social interaction aspects of teaching and learning, which is the antithesis of the so-called personalization tools. And then there are the ethical questions, starting with the ethics of data. Issues such as informed consent. Rarely are the students given the choice of whether they use the system. And what about privacy? Or is it surveillance? And ownership, who owns the data that the students create with their interactions? The students or the commercial developers? A recent report in the UK by the Digital Futures Commission found that edtech companies such as Google are collecting unknown quantities and types of personal data from child users during their learning, and they use this for commercial purposes. But although thinking about the ethics of data is necessary, it isn't sufficient. There's also the ethics of pedagogy, including pedagogical choice. Almost every existing commercial learning with AI tool adopts an effectively behaviorist or instructionist pedagogy, an extremely primitive approach to teaching and learning that involves spoon feeding information while avoiding failure, and which ignores more than 60 years of pedagogical development. Spoon feeding also prioritizes remembering over thinking and knowing facts over critical engagement, thus undermining student agency and robust learning. AI ed systems can also disempower teachers, turning them all too often into mere technology facilitators. Someone who switches on the equipment and maintains behavior in class. But good human teachers do far more than that. This is a complete misunderstanding of what goes on in real classrooms. And then, of course, there is the elephant in the room, ChatGPT. But what ChatGPT and the other similar generative AI tools can achieve is amazing. But their use in education and the challenges are still being worked out. Now, I'm sure that most of you have played with it. You enter a prompt and ChatGPT automatically and quickly generates a human-like text response. But ChatGPT is only one example. There are many others, such as BART, Stable Diffusion, and many others. And generative AI is not just about automatic text generation. Generative AI can also create artificial images like this one, all in response to textual prompts, 
or photographs like this, again, just in response to written response. Now, both of those images have won competitions in competition with human painters and photographers. But what's interesting about all of this is that, in fact, this technology that we're talking about, ChatGPT, is not especially new. This slide I first showed around five years ago. So what's the big deal? Well, not one of these is a real person. Not one. They've all been generated entirely by an AI tool five years ago. But what is new is that ChatGPT was made really easily available to anyone with an internet connection. Now, at first glance, you might think that's a generous gesture by the company that developed it. But they did it because they wanted to increase their share price because they were in the process of selling their company to Microsoft. In any case, it's a bit like launching a new mode of transport, such as this SpaceX rocket, without first fully testing its safety. So was it really generous? For me, ChatGPT is amazing and worrying in almost equal measures. So sticking with this text generation, how exactly does it work? Well, it's a bit like autocomplete, like you find in Gmail when you're typing and it suggests words for you to use, but on steroids. It takes your prompt and draws from its database of billions of words, the word that is most likely to follow it. Then it chooses the next word, that again is most likely to follow the first word, and so on. Naturally, it's a bit more complicated than that, but that gives you the general idea. Personally, I've enjoyed using it a lot. The first time I used it, it was inspiring. He helped me to get past my writer's block, to get started on my writing so I could finish my academic paper. And it turns out, that it's great for things about which there are no disputes, such as here, a list of typical research methods. This is a slide that I use ChatGPT to generate for my teaching. But as I found out, ChatGPT is not as good at anything controversial. And of course, there have been worries around the world about the impact of ChatGPT on education, particularly on formative and summative assessments, and especially on cheating. So what are the key problems? Well, first, as I've mentioned, the text that ChatGPT outputs looks human-like. It looks accurate, but often, it isn't. If you use it to generate some text about something in which you are an expert, you will notice immediately its superficiality, what it misses and what it makes up. But students and other novices are unlikely to notice all that. To them, it can look definitive, which it is not. So for me, a key danger lives in that disconnect between appearance and reality, between the appearance of accuracy and the reality that it is not. Second, there's the disconnect between the appearance of novelty and the reality. As I've mentioned, and it's more obvious with the image generation tools, Generative AI works by scraping billions of images and texts from the internet and remixing them to create the appearance of novelty. The picture on the left is a real photograph. The picture on the right has been generated by a generative AI tool. 
but the novelty is only in the mixing. To get there, it needs the original images and text, which it has taken with no concern for intellectual property. So this has led Getty Images to sue Stable Diffusion. And there's also a class action against Microsoft, GitHub and OpenAI by the writers of software text and code that have been used so that ChatGPT can automatically generate code as well. Another problem is that it by design, it only reproduces the received wisdom, the majority opinion. And so it ignores minority opinions and alternative perspectives. It also marginalizes the voices of the already marginalized. And it's perpetuating across the world a Silicon Valley perspective, a world outlook. And also it will potentially stifle innovation, which of course always starts off as a minority opinion. A final problem here is that by definition, given that it scrapes all of its data from the internet, that data is full of horrific materials, lies, damaging images and biases. And this is why OpenAI, the company that created ChatGPT, has employed thousands of workers, many in Global South Commonwealth countries like Kenya again, to identify and prevent objectionable materials appearing in ChatGPT's output. This is known as setting up the guardrails and the Kenyan ghost workers, well, they will pay just $2 an hour to sift through all the nastiness to ensure that it didn't appear in ChatGPT's output. The point I'd like to make is that if we need the guardrails, then that suggests that the foundational technology is not working as it should. In any case, the ethical issues here are plain to see for all. So, what about the impact of ChatGPT and other large language models on open education resources? Well, there are many suggestions as to how it might be used. Just spend a few minutes on the internet and will you come up with many, many different suggestions, ranging from using it to inspire the development of new content, to generating writing structures and giving multiple examples, to summarizing or remixing existing OER, to generating questions for an open textbook. And as I say, every day, new questions, new ideas are appearing. And they're already products designed specifically to help teachers use generative AI to create lesson plans and lesson materials. So what's my advice? Should we be using ChatGPT when creating open education resources? Well, if you can get past the ethical issues, the IP theft, and the exploitation of some Commonwealth citizens, I guess it can be useful. In any case, when I speak about it to my students, I say, okay, use it for inspiration, but do not trust what it says. Always check what it says. And for me, well, I'm still doing writing every day but I find myself spending too much time writing the prompts. Time that I should probably better spend focusing on my own writing. It never gives me what I'm looking for. And perhaps now 
the novelty has worn off. So I'm simply using it less and less. In any case, it's also worth looking at the alternatives, such as Hugging Face, which has built a large language model similar to ChatGPT, but with ethics in mind. And Hugging Face is itself an organization that's dedicated to open source materials. So in conclusion, and I look forward to your comments and your questions, to be clear, I'm not saying that AI or AI in education or generative AI are always bad. I still do believe that there is some amazing potential, but I am criticizing current applications, current ethics, and the way things are currently developing. In my opinion, we need to change the trajectory. So what I am saying is that AI is amazing, but not as amazing as many people claim. AI is already having a major impact in education, and it has the potential to transform education for good. But if we're not careful, also for bad. We also need to challenge the idea that AI in developing countries might replace teachers. That's a techno-solutionist approach, which never works. Meanwhile, the newly accessible generative AI, again, does bring some amazing potential. But as I've mentioned, it also brings some serious ethical concerns. And while it can be inspirational and can generate many useful things, I recommend that you never, ever trust it. Thank you very much for listening. Mm -hmm.